I myself and we and Finn we have a sort of a joint set of slides, so we uh, we alternate a bit. So so the, the title for the for the two of us together is uh, is the weed, which is the World Income Inequality Database, and two examples of of its value for research. And in my part, I'm going to talk about the the weed. Uh, in general, um, a little bit about its history, and then um, about the latest update what we have been working on um, in, in th this year, and 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 then in the in the end of my talk, which is uh, which is the following uh, Finn's talk, I'm, I'm also um, showing some very preliminary results on what can be said about redistribution based on the data we have it in the weed. So that's the plan ahead. Um, so I skipped the uh, the first part, but the uh, so I'm as I said I'm going to introduce the latest update of the World Income Inequality Database, which we have dubbed the V3.3, uh, and and then I'm uh, then I'm in the in the latter part I'm going to um, uh, just dis describe uh, do some descriptive analysis on what's currently being done to address inequality. Uh, so this is the extent of redistribution across the world. And finally, if time permits, I'm, I'm going to uh, show you some uh, preliminary regre regression results on the, on the determinants of redistribution. So what if you try to explain the redistribution in, 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 the all, in, in all countries in the world for which we have data? So let me start about, the, um, about, uh, about describing in the weed. So this is, as, you, as many of you know, this is a collection of information on economic inequality in all countries of the world. And this is freely available from the wider web page. Uh, so, so the weed was first put together uh, using uh, combining World Bank data and then, um, um, then adding some additional observations, which were basically first co uh, collected for a research project, that, that, but then it, it was realized that it makes sense to, to keep them out as a public good to other researchers as well. So this is. If you like, this can be called like a Vietnam version one. Uh, V2 uh, was then a major revision which, uh, where much more information um, was added on the underlying assumptions regarding the observations. And also a quality rating to the observations was added. And the latest update of that took place in uh, 2008. And, now, and, and then last year, we, we introduced V3 where, where data for seven more years uh, were added, and then we addressed comments by Professor Stephen Jenkins of the LSE, and I come back to those in a minute. So, the, so the basic philosophy in the weed is really that the is really the notion that the Gini index can mean very different things, depending on whether it's uh, defined on the basis of income or whether it's defined on the basis of consumption. Then even with an income, um, obviously we can make a difference between gross income and net and disposable income, so income before and after government intervention. Uh, we can use defi defi different equivalent scales, or, or then equivalent scales are not being used, and the area and population coverage, etc., etc., et et can differ. So the point is that the weed gives all this information to the users. So what it does is, in our opinion, it enables reasonable comparisons of inequality across, uh, between countries and across years in a, in a, in, in a, in a given country. Um, a final point I would like to make on this slide is, is the last bullet, which is that the um, inequality data in developing countries especially is not collected every year. So, so an outcome of that is that the weed actually has many empty observations. But we don't pretend that, uh, that there, there, there actually would be data, uh, uh, but, so we don't do any imputations for, for the raw data. So we work with the, on the data, but they actually exist in the world. The weed was evaluated uh, uh, last year, and there's a, there's a forthcoming uh, journal, um, special issue in the Journal of Economic Inequality. And, the, and as I said, Professor St Stephen Jenkins of the LSE uh, made a comparison of between the weed and what is called the SWEET, the standardized world income inequality database. And, uh, and Jenkins' main conclusion was uh, that he rated the, the weed as a credible source for work on, on cross-country inequality, and also superior, by the way, to the SWEET. 
And this is precisely because we give all this information to the user that they can actually know the data if they want to, what, what they are using. Uh, moreover, he had a number of useful additional points, and we, we did our best to incorporate them, them all to the, um, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the revision of WEED last year. And these are being explained in our, our response to Jenkins in, the, in, the, in that special issue. Now, the latest weed is, is almost ready. Uh, it's, a, it's an annual revision, so we, we, are main, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are planning to update the, the database on a constant basis, and, and it will be published shortly after the conference. So obviously there are some new observations. Uh, we have also simplified the, 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 some of the categorization of some of the background variables. Mm -hmm. So we felt that it's easier for users to, to work on, a, for example, just on a, like a three or at, at most four equivalent scales than rather than, a, rather than a, a greater number of those which, were, which are currently in the weed. And most importantly, there's going to be a more user-friendly query and, and visualization system, which, uh, which you can also already test in the, um, in the uh, what is called network cafe here in the, in the foyer. So that was my first bit, and now I, I give the, uh, the, the, the floor to, uh, to Finn, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I don't quite look like Francois Bourguignon. Um, he was supposed to be the speaker on this panel and unfortunately got in golfed in a meeting in Paris and therefore will only be here tomorrow. Uh, so I had to step in at relatively short notice, um, but I prepared something which I thought I should uh, contribute. <clears throat> For those of you who wish to hear what Francois would have said, there is now a session tomorrow, which will um, also be covering uh, inequality in uh, China, Mexico, South Africa and India, together with Francois's uh, global overview. Now, in September of 2014, Wider Actor did hold a conference in inequality measurement, trends, impacts, and policies. So I, I should not repeat myself. Um, I did make um, quite a number of remarks, uh, at the, which are now available at the Wider of YouTube. But it's not just because I want to show a picture of myself. When you actually go to the Wider YouTube, you will find a series of presentations on these issues, uh, which I would really strongly recommend. I think this is probably the best set of videos that we have uh, ever made uh, on a conference. And at the website, you will also find, for example, uh, the information, the presentation, the keynote by uh, the then Minister of Strategic Affairs of Brazil, Marcelo Cortes Neri, uh, who gave the keynote uh, in September uh, of last year. It's also pertinent here to highlight that WIDER has a very strong and very proud tradition on work on inequality. Two former directors of WIDER are in the audience, and I wish to stress that what we are doing now is really that we are building all of that, of that hard work that they put in. It's that we are trying to continue to the best we can. And in addition to that sort of in-house work, well, there is work beginning with Amartya, but also Andrea and Tony Atkinson and, and Tony, and many others. Now, what is the point that I kind of thought I should try to leave with you? Well, it emerges a little bit out of discussion from Vietnam. I mean, some of you may know that I work quite a bit in Vietnam. Um, been going there four times a week, uh, four times a year for 15 years after staying there for three years. And there's a debate about, is Vietnam a success? But then others say it's a failure. And I've sort of been puzzled about it, I've been sort of scrapping my head. I mean, why is it that when I sort of try to say, look, Vietnam has been doing very well, uh, then others uh, are really saying it's not going very well. Well, we as economists, we know a formula which is, says T times G is equal to 69. This is Basically, the doubling time times the growth rate is equal to 69. So if you grow by 6.9% a year, 
you double your national income every 10 years. Now, so take Vietnam, um, take 1986, and assume that at that point in time you had one dollar per person in a family. Well, after 10 years you had two, after another 10 years you had four, and after another 10 years you had eight. Assuming, of course, that this rate of growth was equally distributed, all that kind of assumptions. In other words, you moved from one to eight over 30 years. Now take another individual who had $10, or a family where each individual in that family had $10 per capita. In 1986, 10. In 1996, 20. In 2006, 40. And in 2016, 80. Let's not mention the one with 100. <clears throat> now, already Plato warned us that we have to be very careful when we are speaking about how we understand the world the relativity of what we see and how we believe that the world is actually hanging together. So that's one first point of departure. Another point of departure was already mentioned quite extensively uh, by Stieglitz in his notes uh, just uh, a few minutes ago. But this is actually a quote from the World Development Report 2006, which I always keep in my mind. It was stated there that the dichotomy between policies for growth and policies specifically aimed at equity is false. So that was the point that Stieglitz tried to make. Another citation from the World of Emory Report is that the distribution of opportunities in the growth process are jointly determined. That for me has always sort of been something that I've kept in mind because it's incredibly important because it highlights why it is that we are focused so much on inequality and trying to understand it and trying to measure it right. Now what this implies is that some policy can involve redistribution of influence and advantages or subsidies away from dominant groups. That's what UK is going to be speak something about. But I think it's also important here to remember that good redistribution may not always be directly to the poor. This was what sort of Steve O'Connell was having, I think, in the back of his mind when he last night sort of said something about that, well, we could just try to give all the poor the amount of money for them not to be poor. But then was that really the right policy? There are trade-offs here. Now, uh, I'm in the middle of doing some work with uh, Miguel and Lawrence on using the WID, and this is what I'm going to uh, try to report. The questions. What are the most recent trends in global inequality? Has global inequality increased or declined? Some of you may be surprised by that question, but I actually believe it's a reasonable question to ask. Have these trends been homogenous across regions? Ravi already alluded uh, to part of the answer. And now comes, I think, an important point, which is that is the picture of global inequality trends using absolute measures of inequality consistent with a picture using relatively inequality measures. If you follow the debates surrounding the post-2015 development agenda, you might occasionally have been somewhat confused. And I can at least say that there are quite a number of rather confused policy briefs and other things out there, at least in the general uh, development discourse. Now, the predominant relative inequality measures, such as the uh, Gini and the Tile, well, we know that values remain unchanged when every income in an income distribution is uniformly scaled up. So in other words, what happened to inequality in Vietnam between that person who had one dollar a day to two, was it eight, and then the one who started with 10 and went to 80? Well, inequality didn't change. Relative inequality didn't change. That's a number that economists tend to focus quite a lot on and if you look to the literature, that has very much been the sort of reference point. And we would often kind of implicitly say, well, inequality is going up or down based on that relative measure. But what we're sort of trying to work on is that, well, the less commonly used absolute inequality measures, just such as the variance, 
There, values remain unchanged when every income in an income distribution has the same income added to it. Now, sometimes you would argue that relative measures have been sort of associated with a more conservative judgment, whereas absolute inequality is more kind of leftist, if you wish. Um, now, data. Yuka already said, what is the database we've used? We've used the updated um, information we have in the WID. Um, and what are the results? Well, has global inequality increased? Well, no, it has decreased. If you take the green line here, the Gini has gone down systematically since 1975 to 2010, relatively sort of step by step, but you know, it has been falling. And it is the same picture when you look to the tile, but the tile you can decompose. So there you see what is it that has been driving this. Well, it's actually the between, comp between country component that has been driving the fall in global inequality. So said a little bit briefly, it's the rise of China and India which have, been, which have been growing much faster than what we've seen in the developed world. So it's that sort of, it's that difference that has been closing. It's not the within country component that has been explaining this. If you look at the red line, that's the between country component, and you can see that's the one that's sort of driving. But the one thing to, re, to just take from this is that has inequality fallen? Well, has it been stable? Has it increased? Well, measured by the relative inequality measured, it has fallen. I'm not now saying whether this is uh, the way we should measure it, but just, just making that observation. Now, we can also look at relative regional inequality, and this brings home Ravi's point very clearly. You see very significant differences uh, between uh, the different regions. Um, this is, in this case, with the tile index, but you can see that the development has certainly not been the same in the different regions uh, of the world. And let's not just take Europe as one example. Well, some countries have experienced a steep rise in inequality. Denmark, my home country, Sweden, France, Bosnia and Herzegovina are countries that have seen a steep rise in inequality since the 2000s. I don't know whether this is why the new government in Denmark now is going to abolish the use of poverty lines. This has now been taken off the public agenda. Resources are no longer going to be used for that. Other countries have observed a decline in inequality, Belgium, Italy, Norway and Ireland. Then there are others with a more flat trend. And then there are again others where you have different sort of trends over this 35-year period. If you look to global absolute inequality estimates, this is just using the variance. There are other measures, but they pretty much show the same thing. Just, boom, up there, increasing a lot. Think Vietnam. Think that very simple example I gave in the beginning. Relative inequality stayed the same, but the one person who had one dollar arrived at 80, sorry, at eight, and the one person with 10 arrived at 80. Your perception of what happened may be very different depending on which number you're looking at. Now, using the weight, using the data, you can also make a series of, we call it counterfactual scenarios, it's really just calculation examples. I'm not saying this is a full sort of counterfactual, but you can sort of ask these kinds of questions. Well, what if India and China incomes per capita and the distribution of income had remained at the 75 levels? Well, then if that had happened, then global inequality would have um, instead increased during this, uh, this period from uh, 0.739 to 0.757, according to the Gini. Um, and it would have also increased um, by the uh, tile index. So what's the conclusion? Well, using standard relative inequality measures, global inequality 
steadily declined over the past three year, de decades. There's a lot of heterogeneity out there that we should work hard on trying to understand, as Ravi, in my view, correctly uh, pinpointed. But we might occasionally be very careful in trying not just to take the North American experience and then impose that on the rest of the world in how we are thinking about what has been happening. When using the absolute measure, the variance inequality measure, we find that global inequality has increased dramatically. Now, <clears throat> I just mentioned that I am Danish, and of course, for that reason, I often refer to Niels Bohr. He was a clever man, he got the Nobel Prize in physics. Physics is something that you might sort of see as, that's really stable, there we really do measure something that's sort of, kind of, we know we're talking about, that's not so variable, that's not so susceptible to many things as in economics and social science. Well, Niels Bohr did argue in his complementarity theory that with observations where we believe that we see the same thing, we often see something different, and therefore will arrive at different insights. And I guess the point is that these insights are not necessarily contradictory or meaningless. They are complementary. I'm not trying to suggest that everything is relative and so on and so forth, as Montek was discussing last night. But I am trying to say here that it's very important that we understand that the relative glasses do not give the same kind of understanding like the absolute ones, and that we do need to keep this complementarity in mind. So yes, I, I would strongly echo Atkinson and Brandolini in emphasizing how central the choice of measure is to any discussion of what happened to global inequality. And I may be overemphasizing that. Some may say that this is rather banal, but I can tell you that I have during the last sort of three, four years been sitting through one meeting after the other where this point has not been kept in mind. I will basically stop here just with one question. Over the past 35 years, relative inequality has fallen and hundreds of millions of people in the developing world have been lifted out of poverty. I think there's reason, as has been said before in this conference, that this is a major achievement. But would different policies have managed this without the increase in absolute inequality? And how do policymakers minimize this trade-off moving forward? I kind of sort of leave that just to, as something maybe to discuss. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Dr. Yuka, you have uh, something to add? Um, yes, yes. Uh, uh, so I was planning to add uh, uh, something on, on, on some results on redistribution, because uh, while it's the case that the, using these conventional measures. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Finn just pointed out how the um, uh, using conventional measures, world in income inequality has actually declined, but it's still at a very high level. So then the next question is, what should we do about it? And that obviously leads to the question of, of, of how much, much can actually redistribution affect uh, the, uh, the living standards of, the, of, of all people, people in the world. So that's what I'm, I, I, I wanted to uh, do. In a, in a working pro progress project together with uh, Risto Rönke, who's also at WIDE. So what do we do? We use the, uh, the weed to measure the extent of redistribution in all countries in the world, uh, for which we have data. Uh, uh, we use three possible measures of, of, of um, if you like, absolute redistribution. So this is the, just the difference between the uh, gross income and disposable income of genies. Uh, so the one is to use the uh, uh, gross income and disposable income genies. The, the second one is to use the gross income genie and consumption-based genie because co consumption is going to be uh, uh, afforded by, by, by income which is disposable. And then, then the third measure, you know, just to um, make sure that we capture all possible observations there are, is, a, is a, in a sense a hybrid measure where, where either disposable income or consumption gene is, 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 is taken out of, of the gross income gene. 
One can obviously also examine relative redistribution, so this is the extent of redistribution divided by the underlying inherent or gross income gene. Uh, when we did the calculations regarding redistribution, we favor, we, you remember that in, 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 in weed we have the quality rating, so we favor the high quality observations. Uh, where, where, and and, and uh, if we know the equivalence scale, we use the adult equivalence uh, uh, based genies. So the first question is how many observations have we got? Uh, so this uh, chart gives you an idea of, of the number of of observations over five-year periods in uh, in the weed datasets on the uh, on on the extent of redistribution. Now this is the broadest category, so this is where redistribution is measured either based on the um, consumption or disposable income uh, uh, reduced from the gross income. So as you can see, I mean, while the coverage, um, uh, the number of observations increases over time. Uh, it is still the case that, that uh, a large uh, proportion of them come from the developed world, so the, from the industrialized world. For example, the, 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 the bottom um, two uh, parts of the column here refer to the European and, 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 the, and the American uh, continents. So another point is that the, uh, the number of observations uh, it goes down even uh, again if we make the restriction that the, uh, that the equivalent scale for the observations for which we have gross and net genies must be the same. So then it drops from something like around 40 to, the, to, to around 30 during the um, uh, latest decade. Uh, if you, there's still then some information about the actual extent of redistribution across the world. So this is a, this is absolute redistribution. So the, so the vertical uh, axis gives the reductions in, in Gini because of government intervention, and the uh, uh, and the top uh, bottom uh, top top lines refer to uh, European countries and then uh, post-Soviet economies. Uh, where the um, absolute redistribution has been around uh, around 15 uh, points in the in the Gini index, and then the um, uh, then it's already clear from from this graph that the developing countries uh, for for which we have data, you need to remember that for developing countries we have re very little coverage. Uh, there's not much redistribution going on, and the same can be said if he, if he, if he, if you take the view of relative redistribution, but I, I, I skip that in the in the interrupt of time because it basically gives the same same idea. So, given the sort of a relative paucity of of observations, I wanted to make an aside um, uh, to uh, and, and and revisit we, we re, with Risto we revisited an influential study by the IMF from last year. So this is a study by Ostri Burke and Chang Arides, uh, which <coughs> examined how redistribution affects growth. So the idea in their paper, so this is motivated from, from um, actually from a more old fashioned idea of, of, of Okun's leaky bucket, that there would be an, in a sense, this classical, classic efficiency equity trader. So that the, um, uh, if you want to get the higher growth, you, you need to make some sacrifices in, in terms of equity. And they, 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 they then use the macro data, what's available to explain growth, uh, both by gross income inequality and redistribution. And the result is that, the, that there's quite a strong uh, negative impact on, from gross income inequality on growth. So income inequ in inequality would be harmful for growth. The finding is also that redistribution wouldn't affect growth. So the bottom line of that study is that there wouldn't be no trade-off after all uh, in the open sense in the, um, in the, in, in, in between growth and equality. Uh, so the trouble in the study in my mind is, that the, um, is, is the underlying data. So the data for the inequality and redistribution uh, come from the Swedes, so the st standardized um, uh, world income inequality database maintained by uh, Zolt. So uh, in the Swedes, if there's no data for a given country in a given year, uh, 
this is my understanding of, of what SALT does, is that both gross and net income inequality values are then imputed based on values from the same country in different years or, 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 countries in a, um, from, or from other countries in the same year. So in fact, even though we know that, the, that the, for many developing countries, we only have inequality data for consumption-based measures uh, uh, and in, in the time intervals of five to or maybe seven years, in the suite there are observation, annual observations. And why is that? This is because they are, these are all impu imputations. Now, I'm not claiming that we have in the weed all available um, inequality data there is, but we have uh, quite a bit of coverage. And, and once we make a comparison of how much information we have in the weed versus the sweet, which is used by the IMF study, we come, we, we come to the conclusion that actually a very large proportion of the data they use to measure redistribution are based on these imputations, or if you like, guesses. Uh, so even if I personally would very much uh, like that conclusion from the, in the study, I think I need to say that the, I mean, in my opinion, we really don't yet are in the point where, where we actually would have the data to support that, that, that conclusion. And here's an example on, on where, we, where, where we compared with, uh, with Risto uh, the coverage on redistribution in what we can find from the weed versus, versus the, the, the coverage in the, uh, in, the, um, in the IMF study. And they, they, they run uh, separate regressions on the full sample, then what, is what they call a baseline sample, and then a restricted sample. And the difference between these samples is the extent of imputations uh, they, they, they um, allow the analysis to use. And as you can see, I mean, I know that some of the developing country observations are missing from the, from the weed, but yet the, the difference is really striking. Even, even when we compare uh, the coverage of weed, which is the, which is the, which is the column to the right, and then the, then, then the coverage in weed in the restricted sample. Uh, so if there's still time, I don't know. Um, no, you there? have a two minutes. Two minutes, okay, mm -hmm. so, so then I can, Within the two minutes I have, I can say some, some, something about the results on, on, on the determinants of redistribution. So what we did was to, we used five-year averages because Gini is not available for all the years, and we, 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 we run simple regressions. This is not about causations, these are correlations between absolute um, and relative redistribution, um, and then explain them by some of the economic and institutional variables plus inherent inequality, which is the gross income inequality. Um, and in all, all those models uh, where the results are, uh, are here from, uh, we use uh, genies based on the common equivalent scale. And we also use the model to, um, to predict what is called the redistribution effort. So, so that, that's the difference between what we observe in terms of redistribution and what our, our, our nice little model uh, predicts. Um, so the difference, there's, all, all, uh, there's uh, earlier work related to this, but I think the main difference is that we use a much larger set of, uh, of, 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 of countries. I skipped the regression results and the predicted uh, redistribution. I can come, put, come, to, come back to those in the end, plus the slides will be available from the net um, um, after the session. So what are the results? So, so we'll, we find, not surprisingly, given already the descriptive evidence, that GDP uh, is, is very strongly positively linked with redistribution, the, the GDP per capita, I should say. And in a lock-lock specification, we get an elasticity of around 0 0.3. So and also we find that the ethnic unity is very, very strongly positively linked with redistribution. And so is the original Merleys idea um, in the Merleys 1971 um, optimal income tax model whenever the uh, inherent inequality, gross income inequality goes up, the government should react by, by increasing redistribution. And this is what we observe. Surprisingly, the extent of democracy is not positively correlated with redistribution. And then we, have, uh, then we also calculate some of the top five and top bottom countries um, ba based on their ranking in the, in the predictive level of here, absolute redistribution. And they include some quite rather surprising country, countries. You re need to remember that this is relative to, the, to, to our model predictions. Right. So. Um, my conclusion regarding 
the bit on the redistribution analysis is that the, we need to remember that the data is, is lacking for many developing countries. I think all of us, including we at WIDA, we, we, we should do more in, in making sure that we capture everything there is. Uh, based on the data we, we, we do have at our disposal, it looks like redistributive efforts are very, very strongly long linked with economic development. And now if we come back to the idea of world income inequality, there are papers around, there, there are some papers, for example, by François Bourguignon, who unfortunately cannot be here today, but he will be here tomorrow, uh, saying that the, that the ex redistribution in the whole world, taking into, into account things like foreign um, um, dom uh, assistance, um, ODA, uh, official, domestic, uh, uh, domestic official development aid, is only has a very minor impact on, on, on world income inequality. It does have an impact on those at the very bottom. But, it, um, but, but then, then, the, then, then the conclusion, I think, is that there's a clearly a need, if you want to address the, the, the uh, uh, growing inequalities in many countries, is the urgent need to build a more comprehensive social protection systems within the nation states as these countries develop. So thank you. That was all I had. Thank you.